What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Three and Out YouTube page. I'm John Middlecoff, and we are talking football all day, every day. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends. Let's roll, baby. What is going on, everybody? John Middlecoff, Three and Out podcast. Happy Fugazi Friday. Um, I, I got a Fugazi for you. It's positive and negative, but something that was pretty eye-opening that I've heard other people talk about until you experience it, you don't realize, like, is this a racket? Am I getting scammed right now? And there's nothing you can really do. A lot of football action going on. Brandon Ayuk saga just will not die. The Steelers, something Justin Fields said today that just made me shake my head about their situation. Ryan Poles, let's give that guy his flowers. What I witnessed on Hard Knocks, he is an impressive general manager. Uh, guy, I, I started out slow on, but I have come full circle. Uh, or done a 180, I guess full circle would be back where he started. But I, something Ryan Poles did on this last Hard Knocks that give the guy a fist pound. Uh, Bo Nix, named the starter, which I don't even know what is there to be said. Like, of course he's the starter. <laughs> I mean, it was clear after like two passes in the first preseason game. It's like, Jared Stidham, are you going to beat out Zach Wilson? That's the question I had. Joe Shane said something that just made me shake my head and I want to put a bow on this Brian Flores to a uh, Belichick tree, just kind of this entire thing, because I was in the car yesterday driving around and heard something that just made me like, give me a break. But before we dive into football and we got a lot going on the last weekend of the preseason, thank you. Uh, we can move on from that, set our rosters and get to the regular season, which is right around the corner. Got to tell you about my friends, my partners in the official ticketing app of this podcast game time. Uh, they are the best, best ticketing app I've ever used. The ability to search by event, search by venue, search by you, you name it. Price points, flash uh, deals are incredible. You can do anything. Go to a game, college or pro, concerts, comedy shows, you name it. They have you covered. Go do something fun. And in these inflationary times, save a little money. Cannot recommend them enough. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code. John for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and redeem the code JOHN for $20 off. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Hey, before we dive into football, Bugazi Friday, uh, I did not do a podcast on Thursday. That was not the intended plan when Thursday morning started, but we woke up and at my house, Lolly. Uh, a little pug shih tzu mix was in bad shape and it was clear something was really really wrong and maria spotted her kind of peeing some blood and we had to get her help and we had to get her help fast she was something was way off and then a couple hours later spent all day in the er you find out halfway through you know if you don't do something fast she has a week to live so basically you're just like yeah do whatever you need to do scary times and I have never, I, I've never had a small dog. I, I grew up, you know, in a family of duck hunters. We always had bird dogs, labs that live, I, I would say, pretty consistently 13, 14 years old, have a lot of energy their whole life. I've never been around a small dog. If you would have asked me five years ago, would you ever want a small dog? I would have said no. And then you're around a small dog and you fall in love with the small dog and they become part of your family. And you just I couldn't imagine not having a small dog moving forward, though I also want to get a big dog. Well, you're in the ER and you're just trying to save the dog's life and all of a sudden emotion starts hitting you. And I, listen, I've been in these hospitals when a parent did not come out. Like I've seen the worst of the worst in those situations. There is no worse feeling than that. You start having consistent like human feelings that you've had before. You're like, this is a powerful moment. And then as everything, the tension settled down, she's going to be, we think, okay, you just keep saying Yes. And I've heard people rant and rave about vets and these ER situations. Obviously, healthcare, just with normal humans, gets outrageous depending on the level of coverage you have. But for a dog, you just, one, you can't communicate with them. So you have no clue what's going on. And it's almost like when your car breaks down, and if you don't know anything about cars, the mechanic can say whatever he wants to you. You can call him out, but you know nothing absolutely not they got you by the balls and it's usually why when you leave after something's wrong with your car either at the dealership or at an independent guy it's usually not very cheap 
And I've heard people be negative in this situation. Like it, they charge you. And I was like, ah, it can't be that bad. And then you get the bill for some medicines, for some x-rays. And it's like $2,000. Now at the time, like the number, as long as I had the money, there was no amount of money to not save the dog's life. As long as it wasn't something that was just going to keep her alive an extra day. Like if this can save her life, she's going to be fine. Here's a credit card. But then you're paying at the ER. Again, the dog can't communicate. So you kind of take everything they're telling you at face value. And you, emotions are high. You want to believe everybody. And there's like three other people paying as well. And they're giving their credit card. And I'm hearing the numbers that are coming out. And it's like, I'm 1800. This guy's 1400. This other person's 2200. We drive home. Again, I think the dog's going to be okay. We're not through out of the woods yet. It's going to be a rough next five days. But signs, I, I'm optimistic. I start doing the math. I go, what are they making a day there? If they just pulled down five, six K at four in the afternoon, granted, I'd been there all day. Maria had been there longer. I mean, we're talking like seven hours in the ER of dog going back and forth, getting different tests. I'm like, is this place making 50 grand a day sometimes? Are they making 30 grand a day? What are they making a month? Hundreds of thousands of dollars. The businessman in me is like, how do I invest? <laughs> can, can I open one of these? But there is a situation that you get humans who, and I would imagine we got a lot of dog owners listening or watching this. That, that love is, is it's a powerful feeling. And it's, it's as real as real gets. And you're just going to say yes. Well, hell, if you don't have the money, you, you pay for it on a credit card. But the amount of money that thing's racking up, and I talked to someone the other day, they're like, you know, part of hospitals, right? The, you know, the insurance companies, everything. This is just, you're just pocketing the cash. They have to be one of the great businesses in America. These, especially the dog ER situation. I mean, the checks and balances there. Who's ever, like, you can't even argue over. Like, I, I can't even imagine. And, and listen, I would guess there have been people in positions. I remember when my brother was on a four-wheeler probably like, Seven, eight years ago with my brother or with my parents' dog, Callie, she jumped off the four-wheeler. Her leg got caught and it tore ACL. And this is probably like 2014 or 15. And the ACL surgery was like, and at the time she was like four or five years old. It's like six grand. And I, I can't even imagine that same surgery now, inflation. I mean, we're talking 10. It's just, it's crazy. I, I just think that the business model if you look at it from the side, if you want to invest or whatever, it's got to be one of the better businesses in America. And then when you're on the side of just trying to save your pet's life, you just start asking yourself, am I getting scammed here? Because they know that I can't say no, but I this is seems a little crazy to me. Especially the older you get, like you've been in a lot of situations. You bought properties, you just, you've been in the private sector for a while, like you've seen a lot of shit. And you just go, I don't know. I'm not saying you're screwing me here, but I'm not saying you're not screwing me. Someone who's not getting screwed. I, 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 I would say that I am pretty, I, I guess I would tend to lean pro team over pro player because I'm pro fan and I want the team. Like I, I think anytime a team makes a tough decision, they're making it in the best interest of the entire squad which benefits the fans who pay for all this. Like none of this exists without them. But I do understand uh, just as a ca diehard capitalist, like any human being wanting the most money they can get. And as a player in the NFL, unlike some of these other sports, your shelf life is really short, right? The They say the NFL stands for not for long. can end at the moment's notice. No matter how good you are, you have a major injury and you're done. So you have to strike while the iron's hot. So I get Brandon Ayuk, especially when he sees the market and goes, I'm one of the better wide receivers in his mind. Uh, what I mean to one of the best teams in the league, trying to get the most amount of money possible. But I also look at it from John Lynch's standpoint. I, I've been, been in the league. I've been following the league. Contract negotiations can get very emotional. They tell you, take the emotion out of business. It is difficult, and I'm not in a similar situation where I'm asking for $30 million a year, but my business is me. Like three and out podcast is myself. 
So when I negotiate anything on behalf of this podcast, on behalf of me, it's not like some entity where there's products. As a player, like your business is yourself, your feet, your hands, like it's all you. So it's impossible to remove 100% of the emotion. But Jordan Schultz, like 24 hours ago, tweeted that John Lynch and the 49ers met with Brandon Ayuk. There will never be another front office and there will never be another player that over the course of six months have more face-to-face meetings. Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak, Cal Ripken's 10 million straight games, it is that level of a record. All these other contracts, it's like CeeDee Lambs, talk to my agent, pay me, this is what we want. Trent Williams like, talk to my agent, this is what I want. Brandon Ayuk is so emotionally connected in this that I feel for John Lynch. And he is one of the highest paid GMs in the NFL. And that job, you know, there, there aren't job requirements. You got to do a lot of stuff that you're like, I'm not getting paid to do it, but you're part of the deal. You got to talk to players, part of the job description. But they've had like 17 meetings. He had to leave vacation in the summer to meet with Brandon Ayuk because he was too emotionally caught up in everything that was going on on social media. This thing's crazy. It's exhausting. And I I just, I don't think we'll ever see another contract. We've seen a lot of ugly contract negotiations. But we've never seen a player who clearly wants to stay and who gets so caught up because he doesn't have that much going on, always on social media. And the 49ers are constantly having to talk to him, even though the agent is the guy negotiating on behalf of him. And Ryan Williams, Ayuk's agent, and John Lynch are like lifelong friends. I, I just, this is fucking exhausting. There is no way around it. It is, it's jump the shark. I honestly don't even take it seriously. I, I, I don't. I don't know what the end game is here. There are rumors today on Thursday that he's going to get traded to Washington. I, I, I just, wake me up when something happens. Nobody, nobody, including John Lynch, wants to hear about like, hey, he wants to meet again. We've all been part of meetings. Some matter, but after a while, like you cross the line of diminishing returns. What could possibly be taking place in these meetings? And it doesn't feel like we're close to one of those moments when TJ Watt walks right into the owner's meeting or owner's office and goes, Mr. Rooney, let's get a deal. He's like, Brandon, tell me I'm good. Tell me I'm good. John's like, yes, we like you, man. We like you. We like you a lot. What, what are you saying in these meetings? I just, it just feels very elementary. It feels very immature. And that's what the 49ers, you know, Brandon Ayuk's been an excellent player for them, but there has to be moments over this where they're just so tired of this crap. Because part of dealing with Trent Williams' contract negotiate, welcome to the NFL. But it's like, hey, this is my number. I'm Trent Williams. Pay me. You don't need to call me off and on. This, this is what it's going to take to get done. And maybe they come down a little bit. Maybe they meet in the middle. But, like, there's not, like, this, please tell me how good I am. That's what it feels like going on with the 49ers. Been hungry for some college football? Well, we finally get a taste this weekend. Don't miss any of the action. Jump in at DraftKings Sportsbook. It's a small but mighty slate of games for Week 0, including a big matchup in Ireland. This is going to be DraftKings' biggest college football season to date. Enjoy the ride. Now, all the way through the expanded playoffs. Plus, all newbies getting into the college spirit, here's something extra special. New DraftKings customers bet just 5 bucks to get 200 in bonus bets instantly. Score big with DraftKings all college football season long. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the code JOHN. That's code J-O-H-N for new customers to get 200 in bonus bets when you bet just 5 bucks. Only on DraftKings. Crown is yours. I think the Steelers have a problem. Uh, if you watch Hard Docs, you saw Tyson Badgett, who started some games last year. And Matt Ryan said in the episode, he's like, God, this guy's gotten a lot better. And his dad, I didn't know this, is world famous arm wrestling champ. And they kind of featured him in, in the last episode for, you know, five, 10 minutes. And one of the parts is it like, listen, I have aspirations and goals. Like I, I want to play, but my role on this team is to be the backup slash player coach for Caleb Williams. And if you go around the NFL to good teams, 
there are specific roles for the backup quarterback. We've talked a lot about it on the mailbag. Like the backup quarterback is essentially kind of a coach and a cheerleader and a positive influence in the room. He does not threaten the starter with his actions, let alone his words. And like Patrick Mahomes, like Carson Wentz doesn't think he's better than Patrick Mahomes. Josh Dobbs doesn't think he's better than Brock Purdy. No one on the Rams thinks they're better than Matt Stafford, right? There's a clear hierarchy around the league for any credible quarterback. Well, when you got two quarterbacks, you often have a problem. But specifically with the Steelers is like all signs point, at least as of right now, Russell Wilson still starting the season. But Justin Fields, when asked today, said like, I've shown enough. It's, a, it's not, it's above my pay grade, but like, I'm ready. I think I'm better. And I don't blame Justin Fields. If you were Justin Fields, you would 100% believe that you're better than Russell Wilson. That's where you get a problem, though. I think it's hard to function when your backup quarterback not only doesn't know his role, at least on a given week, views himself like, this is insane that this guy is starting over me. And I think that you get into very rocky waters when you have two guys, and listen, these two guys are really famous. I mean, Russell's really famous. Fields has become that. And it, it becomes weird. It really does. Because part of being the backup is you got to be there to support the guy, but it's hard to support the guy when you don't take him that seriously. No matter who we are, no matter what we do, we all have a role, right? I got a specific role. The company that I work with with the volume. Right, It's a lot different in Collins and Shannon Sharps and Draymond's. Right? And if you start thinking you are different, anyone listening to this knows, depending, if you ain't the CEO, like your role is different than other people in, a, in an organization. And when you start coloring outside of that role and it starts messing with other people, you can have problems and you can have problems fast. And nothing is more important than the role of the starter and the backup. And no matter, obviously, if they stick with this Russell Wilson plan, I just don't see how Fields, like, this is why we talk a lot about, like, could you could do better at backup? Well, depending on who your starting quarterback, if the backup is better than your starter or thinks he is, that's an immediate no-no. You don't want that, like, the competition at D-line, at O-line, at wide receiver. That is completely different than that, the other position because you can rotate guys, multiple guys can play, corners, linebackers, safeties, like, depending on packages, only one quarterback gets to play. And I, I think this thing, I got this red flags from a mile away. Partly because I think Russell sucks. And second, because I think Fields, it's pretty clear, he's probably a lot like the guy we've seen in Chicago. But his mindset, which, again, I do not blame him for having, is I should not be the backup behind this overpaid, washed Russell Wilson. There was a scene in Hard Knocks which was awesome. And I had clicked on something a couple days ago. I don't follow the Bears like 24-7 day to day. But I had read something within the last, I guess, whenever he was traded last week. Or was it this week? I can't even keep track of the days. Uh, especially after that little lully moment throws you off. But that the Bears were sniffing around Matt Judon. And then you watch Hard Knocks and you go, they were more than sniffing around Matt Judon. They were ready to sign him to a contract extension when they traded for him. Like, they were down pretty far. One thing with the Bears that makes me a little uneasy is a lot of teams, when you're going over stuff, you go over it with the owner, like big stuff. Like, hey, I'm signing DJ Moore. I, the Bears owner is nowhere to be found. I'm dealing with Kevin Warren. Don't love that dynamic. Like, I don't think Ryan, and I get it, that's their hierarchy. Like, Ryan Poles and Eberflu should not have to deal with Kevin Warren when it comes to that type of stuff like that, that is, that makes me uncomfortable as someone who's just followed this league very closely. And I already got Kevin Warren red flag from a mile away as well. But Ryan Poles, whenever he wants to do something big has to go to him. And it was basically like, we're ready to sign him to a contract extension. We'll give a third round pick for him. And one thing that you read about from successful people and learn as you get older is you never want to make a deal when you're desperate. Because when you're desperate and you make deals, it's usually when you make bad deals. That's why most of the best deals in life are made when you have some leverage or are willing to walk away, even if you don't. The most 
powerful two letters in American history are N-O. No. Drives people nuts in business. Like, that is a winning formula. Say no. And the Atlanta Falcons, who are clearly desperate because they have no pass rushers, are like, we don't need a contract extension. If he's willing to play on the one-year deal, if he's not making much money, we'll give you a third-round pick. And as I said, when the trade happened, that's the type deal you make in the middle of October when you're 5-2, and two, and you're clearly going to the playoffs. Not when you just don't know. I mean, the Falcons obviously think they're going to be really good. They made a tra- trade deadline deal in middle of August. Ryan Poles was willing to get aggressive, offered the same amount, but he said this. We'll do the trade, but Matt Judon has to uh, accept a three-year contract. So we're trading for the player, but we want him under contract. Like, we want to have cost certainty or just uh, certainty in terms of we're getting the worth and the value over this. We might be good, we might not be. But it's not worth giving up this pick if we don't have certainty with the player. And he said, if he will not sign the extension, we're walking away. And we're not budging on that. And they didn't budge. And the reason they didn't get him because Matt Judon refused to sign their contract. And that's the type deal. You see these two organizations, one team's out there just desperate doing all sorts of weird shit. None of it adds up. And people think, middle class, you just hate the Falcons. No, I do not. I have no emotional connection to the Falcons. I do not care one way or the other. Love the dirty bird back in the day. But no one can say like, yeah, it feels like they're a pretty normal organization. Starting with the Penix and then putting Penix on ice. Like, give me a fucking break. And when I see Ryan Poles, like, that's what a high-level GM does. I want this player a lot. And hell, I'm willing to give him a contract extension, but I ain't doing the trade without it. It is a no-go. He said, peace, I'm out. So, Ryan Poles, I was hard on the sweat thing. I've come around a little bit. He's clearly the second-best player on their defense. Now, we could argue till we're blue in the face. I do think, and, and I've heard Michael Lombardi say this, he's like one of the only other guys who was negative on the trade. It's like, you probably could have got him for that money in free agency. There's no guarantee. So you give up a second-round pick, you get the second-best player on your team who plays a premium position. I've come around on that a little bit. Early on the Chase Claypool, this dude's battled back. He made one of the greatest trades in the history of American sports in the Caleb Williams-Bryce Young trade. And this is just high-level stuff. Type stuff like how he does. Right? It's like, I, I need these. If they're not, we're out. And he was out. So props to Ryan Poles, who's kicking ass and taking names. Joe Shane gave some quotes to some local media about Daniel Jones and the negotiations. Because let's face it, when you're still talking about the negotiations of a contract, which is a year and a half old, you got a problem. And he essentially said that there is really not a middle class when it comes to quarterbacks. Trust me, that was the selling point for the agents at the time. They do their homework All these guys were coming up as well, meaning the other quarterbacks about to get paid. And I hear what he's saying, but there are middle class for quarterbacks. And you could argue Daniel Jones is lower middle class. And if you sign a lower middle class player to an upper class per year amount, and they gave him $90 million guaranteed, you have a major problem. So the agent can say whatever he wants. I don't blame the agent for saying that. That's his job. It's on you to go, yeah, we're not smoking crack in this building. We're not doing that. This is what we're willing to pay him. And if you're not, and this is going back where they should have franchised, you know, or just let, go hit the open market. Let the open market talk. This is a free market economy. You hit the open market, we'll find out your worth. It's why the running backs bitching and moaning like, guys, we've seen you hit free agency. I I see the numbers you're getting. Like, that's your value. That's what other teams, there's only 32 of them, are willing to pay you. Who was giving Daniel Jones remotely anything close to that? It's the argument with Dak Prescott. It's like, listen, we can nitpick them all you want, but someone would give him an ungodly amount of money if he hit free agency. We've seen Kirk Cousins hit it twice. Got a lot of money. Who was paying Daniel Jones that? So yeah, there's no middle class. Well, we don't think your quarterback's upper class, so we're not paying them that way. (laughs) I think it's pretty, where are you going to go? Like, where are you guys going? Because what you say, great, That I guess that makes sense. But we've seen middle class, we saw Tua, who I would say is, you know, uh, 
not upper middle class, but not middle middle class, somewhere in the middle of that. But at least he's proven like back to back years I, I can compete to make the playoffs. Daniel Jones, I and mean, we saw that first game. What are we talking about? Best season he's ever had. He threw 15 touchdowns. So you, I, I feel like the agents just took advantage of him here. Like they dominated. And sometimes it doesn't matter getting dominated by the agent, right? Getting great players. Justin Jefferson. The 49ers last year got dominated by Nick Bosa's agent. Who cares? Let's say the 49ers get bent over by Trent Williams and his agent. Hit my hat. <laughs> Micah Parsons, you're going to take advantage of me? Okay, here's your money. Where you never want to get taken advantage of is on deals where the ROI ain't going to be the same. Like, can you overpay for property, you know, on the water at Lake Tahoe? Some would argue maybe not. It might not be possible. But you sure as hell can overpay for property in like Stockton, California. I'll promise you that. And I I look at Joe Shane and I go, you got worked. (laughs) And... You don't want to get worked on a player who plays that position who's just not good enough. You are officially screwed. Do you have an upcoming fantasy football draft? Your preparation is not complete until you've used the Draft Wizard from Fantasy Pros. Draft Wizard is the simplest way to turn any set of rankings into cheat sheet form, to have the most realistic mock draft experience to get you ready for draft day, and you have a personal assistant giving you live pick-by-pick advice on that draft day. Get the ultimate cheat code for your fantasy football draft with Draft Wizard. Get started today at fantasypros.com volume. There's nothing really to say on Bo Nix. He's a starter. Of course he's a starter. Uh, I would say nothing has aged better faster than Sean Payton going, we can't stand Russell Wilson slash the draft process. I'm all in on Bo Nix. He took a lot of shit because former players, a million of them have a mic there. They love former players or they love current players. Even if they don't even like Russell Wilson, they're like, that's BS the way he was treated. Russell Wilson stinks. I mean, he, he just, he used to be great. He's one of the most electric players I've ever seen. But it's 2024. He's not any good. If you're an opposing team, you would send a limo, send a bus, send a helicopter to make sure Russell Wilson is ready to kick off. Because you can't wait to play him. Especially when you factor in how much money Sean Payton. Sean Payton was like, I cannot do this. And everyone's like, he likes Bo Nix with that, that guy from Auburn who's just inflated numbers in Oregon. Yeah, looks pretty good. Guy won the starting job. I know it took the second preseason game. Guy won the starting job a week and a half ago. This thing's been a wrap for a while. So, and if Sean Payton and Bo Nix are just show promise this year, that's an all-time win. I know they had to eat the money. That was Sean Payton didn't sign that contract. But th- this notion, some of the takes last year on that were just like puke in my mouth. Give me a break. And I never, I was like, okay, they cut him. It's like they handled that poorly. They're, they're paying the guy like $80 million. So t- to be, I mean, who knows? Maybe but when the dust settles, doesn't even be up Justin Fields for week one. And last but not least, I was in the car doing my seven uh, vet ER trips yesterday. And uh, I'm a serious XM guy. And I flip around the channels. And sometimes I go to uh, channel 85. You know, Dan Patrick will be on there. They just do rerun interviews a lot of times. And they'll have Florio on there as well. And Florio and Chris Sims, who I, I like. Uh, I don't agree with Florio a lot of the time, but I, I appreciate the little hustle business thing he's got going. And, and Chris, like, listen, I I don't have to agree with everything he says either, but uh, he, he entertains me sometimes. Both of them said what Tua said was over the top and unneeded. And I thought this. I said, well... I try not to hold grudges, and Colin had a great line way back in the day that holding a grudge is like chain-smoking hate. Some people, it really drives them. For me, I I don't like sitting in negativity. Uh, I I think I'd be pretty good at talking about politics. I think it'd be pretty successful, but I don't like the way talking about politics makes me feel, makes me so angry. It's not not very fun. Even when I'm ranting and raving about football, it's, it's still ultimately fun, and it doesn't make me mad unless I lose a lot of money on a game like Lamar Jackson, then I get really mad. But they were saying about Tua, like how bullshit it was that he said what he said, calling him a bad guy. And I thought, well, he lived that experience. And I've had some situations. I've been fired twice. And I don't want to say I hold a grudge. The second guy in radio is so irrelevant and just one of the biggest buffoons. He just, 
it doesn't even matter to me. I, I don't actively root against him. I don't even know what the hell he's doing and couldn't care less. But some would say I have a vendetta against Chip because clearly Chip didn't like me and got me out of there. And I would say this. Like, I think Chip's a bad guy. I experienced what I experienced, and I saw what he did to a ton of other people. And that's just a fact. That's my experience. Should I not say that? Because that's that's not a nice thing to say. It's like, no, I experienced it. I know people that I'm very close to experience even worse stuff. Doesn't mean he doesn't know football. Doesn't mean he doesn't know offense. But he's a bad human. <laughs> like, I, I, and I, I, it was come out since when Jeffrey Lurie told him to get the hell out of the building. And I, I think that Brian Flores treated Tua, you couldn't treat him any worse. You're allowed to scream at players. You're allowed to be mean. But clearly what he did felt like it like, what are you doing here? And I was thinking about like all these Belichick guys and everyone, they were giving Brian Flores so much credit. It's like he was humbled. Can you believe how well he handled that situation? What else was he going to say? Nothing Tua said was a lie. Tua was just telling, if you, if you tell the truth, the facts are on your side. Tua is not lying. He has no reason to lie. He's got $150 million just being like, yeah, the guy was fucking asshole. <laughs> like it was, and like I said the other day, this guy comes from Nick Saban. So it's not like he's used to some country club environment. But like, you know, Brian Flores really handled it well. He deserves another shot. Deserves another shot. Bill Belichick can't get a job. The head honcho of the tree, the patriarch of the whole operation, could not get hired. And Flores, who couldn't get along with a guy who's proven to be functional, None of these guys. And here's the other problem. And I fell for this last time. Josh McDaniels. What happened in Denver, it was like, all this time. I remember reading this Dan Pompey article about how he looked in the mirror. He wrote a journal. He really improved. He worked on it. And it's so easy to say that. Like, I've done some self-reflection. I've worked in the mirror. I'm a better person. We all fuck up. Like, I'm not holding that against him. I'm not saying he doesn't regret it. But I've seen the Belichick guys literally say, like, I got to be better. I got to be different and then get another chance. And it's the same freaking thing. So it's, you know why? Cause that's all they know. That's all they've ever seen. Now you could argue maybe Flores. Now he's with Mike Tomlin, Kevin O'Connell. Maybe he gets a new experience, but like if Belichick and listen, who knows? There's no guarantee he's getting a job in 2020. If Bill Belichick is unhirable as a head coach, every single guy under his tree is not even, remotely close to hireable as a head coach then. It's not possible. If you can't hire Bill, the head honcho, the guy who literally taught these guys fucking everything they know, no one else is hireable, regardless of what Tua said. So I, I think this stuff, like anyone being negative about Tua, you know, are we sure he's tough enough? And listen, I have those question marks in terms of the winner, but how can you argue that he's mentally tough enough when he played for Saban for years? It wasn't like, you know, he's only he's a one and done. No. He's with Saban for three years. And this is like not the last. I mean, Saban, especially when he first got there, I think he mellowed out a little bit, but th that is no walk in the park. So this notion that two across the line, no, he had an experience. He believed what he saw and it happened to him. And clearly no one's coming out and being like, you know, Tua, that's not exactly what happened. No. When you experience things. You can say whatever the fuck you want. Like that, that actually happened. Now, if you're lying about it or making things up, it's like you got it. It happens all the time in politics. Like everyone's lying. But in this situation, like this is facts, like these things actually happened. And then he experiences something else. It's like, well, I experienced something else. And that's not the case at all. This guy, and listen, we can nitpick Mike McDaniel, who everyone's making fun of, looks like a Coke dealer. Who, I mean, his curly hair, the glasses, the watch, it is what it is. He's, you know, it's called new money, but regardless, I, I, I have no problem with anything Tua said. And I don't think there's anything Brian Flores can say to take that stink off him because all the Belichick guys couldn't stink anymore in terms of the perception around their ability to be a head coach.